Hello and welcome to today's chapter entitled Real Estate Brokerage. Today we're actually going to start getting into some true real estate. Uh, the topic today is actually going to cover the business portion of real estate. How it gets started, where it happens, what actually happens, some of the laws. So let's dive right in. So as I mentioned, we are going to discuss the real estate brokerage. Now, the first thing you need to understand is that all real estate brokerages in the United States in every state and every state follows this thing called license law. Now, we're going to touch it on, on it in a future chapter, but you will see that one type of law that is actually established is what is called administrative law. Administrative law is law that is handed or given to a group of people to govern themselves from some licensing authority, like the state legislature. So every state has a real estate commission that governs their state regarding the laws of their state for real estate. Different states have differing opinions all over the board. And depending on what state you're sitting in, you see what I mean. For instance, Indiana is a 90-hour course. Uh, Florida is a 63-hour course. Uh, Virginia is a 60-hour course. Um, so there are, each state gets to govern their own administrative rules. But in general, the administrative rules that are called license law actually has four overarching topics that it contains. The first thing is it establishes the basic requirements for licensing and any continuing education. Now, we haven't touched on that word yet, but continuing education would be any education that's required after you have your license in order to maintain your license. So every state establishes their own basic requirements for getting a license. Like I mentioned, Indiana's 90 hours, Florida's 63 hours. Those are just different examples. The second thing license does license law does is define what activities actually require a license. So if you buy, sell, trade, lease, exchange, manage, list, rent, consult, or refer, you need a license in the state of Indiana. Now I try and tell you those slower, but I can't because all I've ever practiced those is to get them fast. All right. So buy, sell, trade, lease, exchange, manage, list, lease, rent, uh, or refer. Probably. See, I told you I couldn't do them slow. Those are the requirements, or those requirements in the state of Indiana require a license to perform for a third-party person, all right? The third thing license law is going to do is establish the standards of conduct and practice that you as a professional must adhere to. There are codes of ethics that we have to abide by and we're going to touch on them today. And then the fourth thing this license law does is explain the disciplinary system to you if you violate any of these first three rules, all right? So quick recap, license law explains how you get a license, what activities are required, how you act when you have a license, and how they can punish you if you violate one of those. So those are the overarching purpose of every license law by every real estate commission in every state in the United States, all right? That are the, those are the rules that we will follow once we are licensed and working professional, okay? So now, <clears throat> let's get started. A real estate brokerage, 
a real estate brokerage is the office or the business, if you will, that houses all of the real estate brokers. It is the legal place of commerce that a broker has to establish to actually have an office, all right? So all of the brokers that are under one company actually reside within a real estate brokerage. Now, that's not entirely true because there you could have multiple offices, but I think you try and get my point that the brokerage is the business. They are housing the brokers in it, all right? Now, because it is a business, the brokerage works just like every other business in the world. There is virtually no difference between Walmart and a real estate brokerage, except maybe a couple zeros in the on the end, all right? Meaning that a real estate brokerage has to still follow all of the business laws that Walmart has to follow. You got to file taxes. You got to have a business entity report. All of the same structure is completed with a brokerage that it is with real business. All right. Now, this brokerage, like any other business in the world, can take many different forms just like any other business can. You could have a brokerage that is a sole proprietorship. So maybe it's just one guy working or one lady and it's just them. They answer the phone, they file the paperwork, they go to the closing and their business is a sole proprietorship. That's possible. It could be a corporation, just like some of the big box franchises that you see. You know, you've got the Remaxes of the world and the Keller Williams and Exit Realty and all those. So it could take the form of a corporation, just like uh, any other business. It could be a partnership. Maybe it's two or three people. I actually know one that just formed here recently uh, where they came to me and wanted some insight on how to operate. They could be an independent brokerage, meaning we call these the small mom and pop, you know, like Bob's Real Estate. Maybe they are a franchise, back to like what we were saying, like Remax. So I hope you see that this brokerage can be any form. It could be a corporation that's owned by uh, a board of directors. They could have one location. They could have multiple locations. My real estate brokerage has five offices within it. So it can be just like any other business that's out there. And because it's just like any business out there, there are activities that we have to do as a broker, depending on what position you're in. I mean, if it's a sole proprietorship, all of these things are going to be required of you. You've got to manage your business. Now, I'm talking about business. I'm not necessarily talking about real estate business. This is the business of the business. Like I said, you still have all these functions. You've got office policies you may have. You've got rent and uh, equipment that you might rent. You've got people you may hire to help you. You've got front desk help. You may have a file clerk. You may have other brokers underneath of you. We're going to get to that. You've got to hire direct staff. You've also got to make sure that everybody that works for you follows license law, as well as obviously all the other laws. You know, that's, that's obviously a given. So as the main broker, you've got responsibilities to operate the business portion of your brokerage. Now, if in your business you have decided that you are going to hire other brokers to work for you, then there's other responsibilities that you have, and there is going to be a relationship that gets built between you 
and that person that's going to work for you. Now, this course is designed to go to multiple states. So it, different states use different terms. So the book is really well known for trying to make this very versatile. So they call it the employing broker. Now understand in Indiana, they call this the managing broker. Places like Florida and Virginia still use the term principal broker. In any way, the generic term that we're going to be using is called the employing broker. This is the person, for lack of a better word, I'm going to use the word boss. All right. People tend to understand that. So the employing broker or the boss or the managing broker has the direct responsibility to supervise all of the brokers underneath him. And that is what they do. They are responsible for the actions of all of the agents underneath of them. And that sales associate, which once again, the book is using as a generic term, meaning all of the people underneath them are responsible only to that one broker. They can only work for one brokerage at a time. And they must all be, all the activities are performed in the name of the employing broker. And I'm sure you have seen this all of the time. You have probably got a friend that you know that you talk to and you say, oh, well, I, I know David who work, works for Keller Williams. Or I know Tom who works for Remax. That is what we're talking about, where Remax, whoever owns that franchise, would be the employing broker and that sales associate works for them and must disclose and declare at all times that they are in fact working for Remax. All right. Now, in the case of a sole proprietor, they still kind of do the same thing. When they say, hey, I'm Raymond Modulin and I work for me, but I'm the only one, all right? Another important factor is you as a sales associate, the person working for the employing broker, you can only get paid by your employing broker. Now, this is a concept that a lot of people don't really get so let's make sure you're clear. And if you're not, I want you to hit pause and go back and re-understand this. So here's in a nutshell what happens. When I, at my brokerage, hire a new sales associate, they work in the name of my brokerage, the Modulin Group, all right? When they go to a closing, the check that gets cut is for the commission is to the modulin group. And then they bring that check back and go, hey, here's, I closed, here's the check. And then I pay that sales associate underneath me a portion of that commission. And we're going to get into all of that here in just a minute, all right? So you can only get paid by the employing broker. You don't get paid at a closing. I get paid at a closing and then I pay you. All right. You work as what is called an independent contractor for me. You are not an employee. All right. So let's go over here and look at one thing. So we make sure we understand. So in the in working world, there are basically two types of workers. The first type of worker is what I'm going to call a W-2 employee, all right? If you have a job and at the end of the year you get that W-2, that is a W-2 employee. Now, the advantage of a W-2 employee to the employer is that he gets to control the system by which you work, meaning 
he will tell you, hey, your job starts at 9 a.m. You get off at 5 p.m. You get a half an hour for lunch. You get two 15 minute breaks. You must wear this uniform with a name tag. And he is defining the system by which you work. The disadvantage or the, the other advantage, depending on how you look at it, for him is that he is going to pay some of your taxes for you. All right. He will pay taxes. And I know you guys have all seen your paychecks before and you go, hey, there were taxes taken out. Yes. He paid some of them and he took some of yours out of the paycheck and paid them as well. That is a W-2. The second type of person, and I'm going to write this 1099, is what we call an independent contractor. Now, an independent contractor is virtually the inverse of this. I cannot define the system by which you work. I cannot tell you, hey, tomorrow at nine, you need to come in and answer the phones and you got to stay here till five. No, you work whenever you want to work. You don't want to come into the office. Don't come into the office. You want to go on vacation for a week, go on vacation for a week. We can't define the system. Virtually, all we deal with is the outcome. How many deals did you close? You told me you were going to close 12 deals this year. You closed one. We might have a discussion about that. All right. Now, I can't define how you did it. If you come to me and go, hey, I'm only going to sell to third shift employees because that's who I know and work with. Fine. I can't tell you yes or no. Um, I'm only going to sell to the Hells Angels Motorcycle Group. Fine. I can't define your system. I can't tell you. I can't restrict. I can't bind you for that. But the upside is I also will pay no taxes. All right. So if you earn $100,000 in commission, I will pay you $100,000. You are going to be left to your own devices when it comes tax time. So you need to be smart enough to realize that when I hand you a hundred grand for doing this real estate, that you pull some of that money out and understand that come April the 15th, you're going to have to pay taxes on your money that you earn. All right. So understand there are two types. There's the W-2 employee and there's the 1099 independent contractor and you will become an independent contractor and like it says here on the board 